Okay. So hello everyone again. This is our, I think, 18th day of the Summer Institute. Uh, I see you're all still here. Nobody has run off. Nobody escapes. You're all still here, which means that we're go doing not too bad of a job so that we ended up uh, scaring you off. Um, today we have Professor Tuba Biljan, and we're really, really lucky to have her. Um, she's an interdisciplinary researcher, and um, her bio says that she's a data lover by birth. So I want to listen to that story, you know, how, how that title ended up, uh, the, and social scientist by choice. And I want to hear about that story as well later on. She currently works as an assistant professor at the Department of Sociology and is the research coordinator of the Interface Demography Research Group at the Free University of Brussels in Belgium. She's also affiliated as a senior associate at HIVA, which is um, at Leuven. Uh, her scholarly interests cover a wide range from migration, refugees, inequalities, equal opportunities, social and public choices, um, to new methodologies and the use of big data and AI for studying societal uh, challenges. She believes in open science and science for society. And today, um, she's going to help us navigate through uh, one of our most um, uh, contested topics that on um, day 14th, or I think day 13th, we discussed um, computational social science ethics. And um, we ended up uh, generating a lot of new ideas. And as a result of those new ideas, we ended up uh, reaching at certain uh, impasse. Um, and we're hoping Professor Birjan will help us solve those, uh, you know, <laughs> deadlocks. Uh, and that's that's a big ask, I realize. But you know, we wanted to start this off as uh, as controversial as possible. So, Professor Birjan, we're so happy to have you. The floor is yours. Thanks a lot. So hello everyone, I'm trying to share my screen. Uh, I think it works perfect. So very nice to meet you all. Uh, yeah, it's a, a lot have been said about me already, uh, but maybe I can start a little bit about the um, data loving and uh, being a social scientist. So uh, I do see that most of the audience are from Turkish education system. So you do know that if you are a student, you are pushed into the math and science track always so that your scores are good enough so that you don't need to waste your talent with other disciplines. So it's something that happened to me as well. So I have been studying math and science uh, during my you know, like secondary education. And then um, I went to Otto, the Middle East Technical University to study statistics where, I mean, by then it was, you know, like pure mathematical statistics. So I, I do enjoyed it a lot. And my life honestly changed in the second year when I got an elective course about social psychology. So um, I, was, I was honestly touched by the group behavior in particular, cause I've been reading, of course, I mean, I had been reading them too. So I had a lot of questions in my mind in terms of understanding the world and the society in general, but I've always was, uh, I was always interested in the differences, like especially the group differences. I mean, how come people create groups in their minds and how does this affect um, the understanding, the perception towards life, okay? So then I said, okay, this is really, really interesting. I gotta see. I read, so I, I followed more courses from sociology and uh, I was always getting a minor and then what happened when I finished, when I graduated, everyone told me that, yeah, you are, you're so lucky, become a banker or a financial analyst or whatever, but I always had hate um, money, despite I love the numbers. So um, I said, okay, I'll give it a try. So I worked at Max Planck Institute for two years. I think it was one of the biggest challenges of my life because I work with ethnographers you know, like the most qualitative social scientist that you can find as a statistical analyst. So then when I was assured that this is my past, um, I went for a PhD and in political science. So in fact, I'm a political scientist, but training, I was more into political um, sociology, I would say. And I studied ethnic discrimination and the community structure. So I've always been interested in the networks 
and to understand it. And we, we do know that society is pretty complex and we are trying to simplify things by generalizing some models and methods to have at least some idea to predict something. So human beings have been trying to predict what's going around them, I don't know, since the beginning of, uh, I know the history. So let me go to the next slide. I don't know why I can't. Mm. Uh, maybe there's there's a um, you you can control it by mouse maybe instead of yeah, that's what I try. Okay, let I'll stop and uh, share it again. Maybe I can use my desktop share. It will be easier. Okay. No, I cannot change anything. The gods of artificial intelligence uh, are they, they yeah, don't want indeed, us to. Yeah. Indeed. Let me see. Okay, it says that I am, I can. You can't. I think I can't share, but I can't change. Okay, nope. Nope, I can't change my screen. <laughs> uh, well, so so you, you can restart the computer. That, that solves every problem <laughs> imaginable. Always, just like always restarting doesn't, everything. Always doesn't so while you're restarting, I can just like keep people busy here. Okay, so today, okay, today we are going to talk about the big data in general and the AI techniques, of course, coming along to study human migration. So instead of explaining you further the technicalities, because yeah, I've looked in depth into the structure of the summer school, I think you already learned a lot how to get different types of data, how to analyze them. But today our questions are a bit trickier than that because I'm not going to discuss the data-driven approaches, rather we will discuss the theory behind AI applications. So um, what I aim to cover today is that starting with understanding the big data approach for migration research in general, then we will discuss the future potentials, what we can do, but we should also acknowledge, acknowledge the current limitations where we will discuss the ethical issues in detail. So um, we do know that when we say big data, you know, like we are talking about three Ws, so I'm not going to reinvent the wheel, but it's important that when studying human mobility and human migration, we are discussing about the digital traces of human behavior. And it is mostly, not only, social media data and the data that we get from smart devices, whatever is connected to the internet. So here the challenge starts, especially when we talk about migrants who are by definition one of a vulnerable population. So is it really possible to track people without tracking them? How can we really follow the traces without violating any kind of privacy and personal rights? Especially if we would like to gain more knowledge about a group that we do not know about. Because you will read that we are living in an era of migration. Migration is a very complex phenomenon. Yeah, we are very, um, uh, you know, like uh, used to these kind of cliches. However, it is correct. So it is still unclear what we mean by talking about when we talk about migration or a migrant. So uh, we will go in there, but I will. I will also like to question a little bit. Yeah, what we understand from a migrant and a migration. So when we are talking about digital traces, in short, big data, one of the advantages that we, you know, like uh, pronounce a lot is that it is accessible. You know, like we do have internet derived data. We can use social media. We can you know, search engines, online interactions. We can use mobile phone devices, like internet of things, wearable technology. Then we are talking about tracking data, which is different than the Earth observations in general. Here, the GPSs that we have on our mobiles, on our cars, sometimes even on our watches. And then the traffic data, the CCTV images. But as a broader uh, data source, we are talking about aerial imagery. So we are talking about satellite data, Earth observations. So we're talking about several satellites going around the globe. But one thing which is usually overlooked is the consent 
So um, if you look at the, you know, like uh, use of term documents, which is with the five font, you know, like with the five font and a couple of pages, when people click, yes, I agree, yes, I agree. Do we really assume that these people allow their data to be used? Because in fact, especially in the case of migrants, the real owner of the data is not the institutes or the private organizations, it is the migrants themselves. However, we do not really ask the consent. So this is where the big ethical question starts. Um, the informed consent, which is one of the main rules that we have in an ethical framework to conduct any type of research, regardless of the data that we use. And then, of course, when you have enormous data, we need very complex methods that you've been learning for a couple of days. But is it really a spur, you know, spur thing? Like, is it the ultimate solution to all problems that we have in the quantitative approaches? Can we really reach out to information that we haven't before? Can it really help us to answer the very difficult questions that we've been asking for a long time? We do know that AI is human driven and it needs data. That's the main nutrition. So, and it needs massive amounts of data. That's why when we are talking about broader applications of AI, we can really talk about existing data, you know, like uh, millions of terabytes. But when you're talking about hard to reach groups and vulnerable populations, this massiveness is under question because yes, we do have plenty of data, but of course it's not comparable. Yes, it is extremely valuable because we can't get that information, especially if you are only stick to the registered data. But we do also know that there have been several papers and studies talking about, or let's say criticizing AI and computational methods to use migrants as lab rats, if, we, if to talk very bluntly. So do we let migrants to provide their data to the, to the computational social scientists and computer scientists to use as plat training platforms is the innocent question. The real question here is, what are the odds of a migrant or a refugee to say no to gather their data, especially if you're talking about the refugee camp or people on the way, or people who are depending on any kind of legal terms to stay in a specific area. So here it is not only about using the existing data, we are also talking about collecting extra data about these people. So we do know that our AI is a simulation of our intelligence, but you see that there are two words in red. It is supposed to think like humans and it is supposed to mimic our actions. If you look at the uh, political, you know, like leaders in the world, you we were with Trump, we have Putin, we have Erdogan, we have rise of right week everywhere. So, and there is there are huge events going all around the world against migrants or against others. So maybe thinking like a human might not be the best way to be fair because we do have the assumption that we, the human beings and the society is fair and does everything in an ethical manner. Nevertheless, it is the ultimate goal. So I do not mean that AI cannot be ethical and unbiased because we are not. What I'm saying that it is easier to improve AI than improving people. So yes, we are going to use AI as a tool but the, the big question to discuss at the end of this course, I mean, this uh, talk will also be the accountability. So as a scientist, we are responsible of the algorithm that we develop to be fair and ethical and unbiased. However, who is responsible for the big picture? I'm not gonna give you this, um, uh, you know, like a um, widely spread example of, okay, a self-driving car killed a person who is responsible. But it is important for us to see the implications on human beings' lives when we look at the, the codes that we are writing to. So it is really about seeing the human beings 
behind the code that we are using. I'd like to start with a paper that I like a lot. Uh, but before that, I guess uh, we have to acknowledge from the very beginning that our questions are not new. We have been dealing with the same questions for a long time. If you have any interest in migration studies, you would see that since 90s, 1990s, we are still talking about the same theories, trying to explain the migration flows. So nothing much changed. So the questions are same for different disciplines even. However, we do have new tools, new approaches, and new data for that. So it is important to take into account the social implications where we are using these new tools not to get too enthusiastic about what we are trying to do. And I really like this little cartoon because on one hand, uh, yes, if the answers are not right, you know, I think it also comes from statistics, you might end up the answers that you're seeking. So I remember our 101 course in statistics years ago. Yeah, our, our professor told that, you know, there are three types of lies, big lies, white lies, and statistics. That's the first thing that he told us. You can get a result depending on how you build your hypothesis. So it is not only the algorithm itself. It is, you know, like here, when we're talking about the humans, we are also talking about asking the right questions. So uh, this paper is, in fact, a not new one and also from medical science mostly. But I really like their approach because they are questioning this uh, wishy circle between idea and data and the analysis, like um, they call it the cycle of knowledge. We are really, uh, when we are, um, let's say, referring to the data-driven approaches, are we really coming as alternatives to the hypothesis-led studies? So especially in the social science, we do know that it is important to have some questions in advance. So because we are not only interested in the patterns in the data, which can lead to several things. I'm sure if you followed some basic statistical courses, you heard about the spurious effects. So the like, uh, if you breathe, I mean, everyone who is breathing dies, okay? But we do not die because of breathing. And it is very easy to get confused of the causal mechanisms in society if you are taking a lot of things for granted. So when we are talking about big data landscape, you know, like we are talking about several things. I'm not talking about the data sources. Here I refer mostly like what is different, you know, like we are talking about apps like vertical or media apps. We are talking about business intelligence, which have been used a lot. But visualization is a big issue. You know that many, many softwares are developing in time. We have the infrastructures, we have operational or analytic infrastructures or SaaS like services. We have structured databases and you have different technologies. But what is interesting here to see that we are talking about full commercialization. So the tools that we use, the data sources that we refer to, even the applications, they all have, a very, have very strong links to the commercial world and industry. So is, is it wrong? Hmm. Yes and no, because um, when we are discussing using big data, I can list a lot of benefits, especially if you're talking about transport, agriculture, innovation, industry. So you can really list hundreds of advantages. However, when we are talking about societal challenges, it gets um, a bit sore because then we are talking about who are the beneficiaries whom we are talking about, who is going to benefit from that applications. So we do know that these applications can help us in the context of migration to better understand simultaneous interactions. Like we can understand collective human behaviors, very importantly in real time and on a global scale. But I'd like to say the question here to you. I wonder what do you think about the question of what is the gain of the migrants from big data and AI applications. Do you think do they or can they or are they already benefiting from big data or AI or do you think they are not relevant yet or we are not there yet? Any reflections on that from any of you? Can they really benefit from big data or AI? So this is a question for the group, right? Yes, yes. Oh, okay. Guys? Anyone? 
Uh, yeah. yeah. Just just charge right in. Don't don't raise a hand. Just yeah, yeah. go ahead. Yeah. We can use big data to uh, construct these recommender systems that uh, find uh, whatever we want in the first place. So we won't. Uh, we we will save time, maybe. Oh, save time. Um, in what? Uh, with recommender systems, for example, uh, you know, when you go to a website and you want to buy oh, something. Okay. Yeah. Okay. 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 Yeah. Definitely. Any other examples that you can think of? Maybe I can give you some hints like where the big data is used. We will discuss very much in detail, but visa applications are automized, asylum applications are automized. A lot of humanitarian aid depends on, let's say, the iris scanning, or we can know better. We can predict migration better. We can know where people are going to go. Even in the cities, not internationally, we can predict a political movement. Do you think uh, this is going to help whom? So when I say we, whom we are really talking about? A couple of days ago, we had a presentation from, unfortunately, I forget her name, and I was trying to find in the Slack group right now, but she was studying the way that migrants get jobs when they come to new countries. And um, she was tracking, okay, so if you have a connection with somebody who already has a job, who's also mm -hmm. a migrant, then you're more likely to get a job there as well. So potentially that's some benefit that migrants can have from. Um, Def definitely for the integration strategies and policies in general, there have been a um, couple of things. Um, but I mean, what I see in, 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 in this, um, I mean, a few examples that we've discussing that, yes, migrants are beneficiaries, but they are not the part of this recommendation or in general in the system. What I mean is that we are talking about the superior or powerful, or I don't know how to call it. So we have the third parties who decide on how to use or how to define uh, the application. Let's go a little bit in deeper. So in the migration statistics, we talk about several gaps, okay? So why we are talking about these shortcomings is that you know, in 2011, Syrian crisis happened. The civil war started as of 2014. These people start to go to Turkey and to other countries. And the influx, the so-called influx to Europe started in 2015. And during those four years, everything was fine. And as of 2015, a lot of uh, questions raised and it was really, really difficult period for Europe because they said, oh my God, how couldn't we see it? We don't have any preparations. What are we gonna do with these people? How we, how we can help them, how we can stop them, how we can send them back. So there were a lot of questions, but it is due to the generic estimations that we use with some traditional statistical predictions and forecasting. To give you an example, the migrant population in 2050 was predicted in 2003 around 100 million. And then in 2010, they had to revise. They said, no, we are wrong. You know, like it's around 400. And today, I mean, in 2019, not today, in 2019, they revised their prediction and they said that, oh, we will have only environmental migrants around 1 billion in 2050. So you do see that. You know, like what we use to predict what's coming along is a bit uh, um, decisive in some cases because the dynamics change a lot. Your variables are varying in terms of definitions. How to define a migrant is extremely important in whatever data you're using. If you're using a social media data or Google data or Facebook data, you've got to start with talking about who is a migrant. So the definition is extremely tricky because we are today talking about different definitions, different typologies, like internal, internal migration, international migration. It could be temporary, permanent. Are Erasmus students migrants or not? What about the cross-border mobility? Like assume that you live in one country and you work in another one. What about voluntary and involuntary like People who migrate due to the environment, are they refugees? Are they migrants? What about the regular ones, which are kept on the record, but the irregular ones, mostly undocumented ones? And there is also the limbo of categories like refugees, return migration, climate migration, lifestyle migration, which is very common in Europe, like people towards their uh, 
retirement, they, they go to Turkey, like, like 50 years full of British pensioners. So in short, it is not that easy to call who is a migrant, although the statistics tell us that nationality and country of birth is enough. So assume that you're going to web scrape some information from Twitter, and you would like to assign who is a migrant and who is not. You don't have their country of birth. You don't know their nationality. You only have the geocoded tweets, so you know where they are and where they move if they do, or you do have the language. So in fact, in the official definitions, we do not have anything about the current situation, current location and the language. However, if you would like to use Twitter data, you gotta find a way to fit in the definitions. So can big data, I mean, social media data help us? I doubt. Go to the second one. When we are talking about demography, gender, and hidden populations, in the examples today, I will already discuss it in detail, but we do know that it's very difficult. Like if you're talking about social media, we don't know if the, because it's self-reported, I don't want, if I don't want to report my gender, I mean, my biological sex, I wouldn't, but I can lie. I can lie. I can call myself an FBA agent living in Los Angeles and a male. So yes, you can clean it up to a level, but if you go in deeper, we are talking about feminization of migration, Roma migrants, humanitarian migrants, family migrants. So there are so many different types of migrants that we cannot touch at all. So the big data still cannot help us to identify those except highly skilled migrants because education information is not gathered in the statistics, but we can get it through uh, different social networks like LinkedIn, like ORCID or ResearchGate or some even um, academic repositories. So I think we should also talk about some good parts because big data will help us to cover a wider geographical uh, space. We are like in general, sociology is pretty statistical static in terms of mobilities, but migration is extremely fluid and we are talking about multiple locations, but the statistics are based on sending country and receiving country and most of the times they are not matching. And nationalism is a different issue that I will not go in depth, but the re regional locatedness is also like patterns of migration um, is really different if we look at the spatial distributions and big data can do help us to understand the geographical dynamics way better than the collected data. Because, you know, like when we talk about population register, we do have residen residential addresses. However, it is, they are usually old and we can really use several geolocated data to do further spatial analysis. And temporality and timeliness, I guess, is the strongest point of big data because you can do almost real time, real in real time analysis. So now casting is very common. We can capture the temporal aspect, and we saw several examples of it, especially during the COVID. So what we cannot touch is when someone stops being a migrant. I've left Turkey in 2005. So uh, I've lived in several countries. I lived in Germany, I lived in UK, I'm in Belgium, and I'm a Belgian citizen. So am I a migrant still? Because I've been living in this country since 2007, or not. But when you look at big data, I might be, though we analyzed my tweets and I appear to be a British <laughs> based on that because I'm using most English. So it might be decisive, but it is very difficult to draw the lines about the definitions. I mean, why I'm referring to definitions a lot because it has a lot to do with your variables, how you define your variables. But in humanitarian crisis, we use it a lot. Um, yeah, political conflicts, uh, let's keep the Arabian, uh, you know, like spring started with Twitter, but we do know that you can really follow uh, political mobilization with some uh, big data, but climate change and environmental factors have been followed and uh, big data, especially satellite images have been used a lot. And also we saw that in COVID, it is in fact, or it might be very easy to access the CDR and the mobile phone data when the governments want it because they could analyze mobile phone data to uh, analyze the mobility spread of the um, pandemic too. And drivers, um, we are talking about why people migrate. There are some attempts that we will discuss, but in general, um, I gotta say that the uh, official statistics and traditional data is extremely short in this sense. So we do not know, we only know the visa, visa, visa applications, but we really don't know why people move 
And there might be also a couple of reasons. You might go for a PhD, then meet someone or find a job or go to another country. So I do hope that computational social science will allow us because network analysis offers a lot to really understand the dynamics of the changing networks because we are more than the nodes. So let's start with some real examples. So this is one of the papers that I really like a lot because um, as I said, we, can, we don't uh, capture a lot of information about the drivers of migration, but Burma at all, they said that, mm, why not? And I think they have a very interesting approach. What they did is they selected several countries and they analyzed the search data. And the, of course, the keyword selection got a lot of critiques of in this paper, but what they did is they uh, defined or identified some words like passport, visa, finding a job, life, costs, or asylum, or family unification. So they really got a lot of uh, keywords. Then they translated that to in several languages, and they did a global scale analysis because they use this global trends index um, and they wanted to see if this improves the existing models. That's the part that I really like. They have, they did not start with, you know, like this is the best model ever. They said that, you know, like, because this data is limited in many terms, so it is not going to be built on this indicator, but why don't we use this index and developed indicators um, to see if they improve our models or not. I, I don't know how much you can see the table, but they do have a benchmark and they add the GTI to the models. And in all cases, you know, like they used very um, conventional uh, variables like GDP, like population, and then the uh, GVP. So they even check the significance. In short, even with the fixed effects, they could find improvement in their models. So. At the end, what they decided, they said that lack of migration data limits research. Yes, we know. They said georeferenced online search data can be used to predict migration flows because they saw they showed that with combining this information with the, with the global migration flows, they could get better models. They said it has a strong predictive performance when compared to the benchmark model. So without this um, big data indicator. And they say that this method can help to measure migration intentions and facilitate policy predictions. You would see such statements in many uh, computational papers because they would like to make sense and link to the real. And they said, that, okay, it is going to have some policy impact. It's gonna make our lives better. But one question I would like to bring here is, what might policy predict? Assume that you're a country and you do know that a lot of people from Afghanistan wanna come to your country. So how can countries, an open question, how can countries use better predictions with big data because it has a lot of sensitive information in there because specifically these people are looking for the words like say asylum what type of policies might come along with this any ideas so i was i have been uh, reading about the recent news I, I i have no background in international relations or or or, or any allied basically disciplines but i was reading a lot for example about the afghanistan and that us and uk and even netherlands i think a bit under pressure that they want to you know to be given like a visa asylum visa for those that wants to escape before the soldiers leave so i mean it can be used maybe to to better predict these peoples but i think this is a very specific case i think on the big level like uk when hostile immigration policy i think it will just probably mm -hmm. just you know amplify what is already there probably in my opinion yeah yeah, definitely. Like, yeah, I mean, I, I gave the Afghanistan case because I read the same things uh, on purpose. But um, what I would like to bring up here is that we can analyze, we can come up with very nice models, 
But when we are talking about applications on human beings, we are talking about some aftermath. I would love to say consequences or let's say the implications to be more positive, but um, uh, the, one of the main questions that the researchers we have about these big data applications is that yes, we can know more, we will have more sensitive information, but how can we assure that you know, like this research will not be used for preventive migration policies, for instance. Of course, you know, like I'm aware that, you know, like, uh, yeah, we can't, you know, like blame science for the wrong decisions of people. That's not what I meant. But um, I think it is important also to think that these methods have been, um, let's also self criticize myself a bit, these methods and these data is very recent for the researchers, but they have been used by governments and military for very, very long years. So in fact, you know, like they, it's not an enlightenment for them. They say, oh, really? Oh, okay, so, so we know, but on the other hand, as the researchers, we're responsible for what we are going to do. So, okay, maybe we are not a noble, you know, like nominate, but in, in the papers that we write or in the analysis that we do, we can already refer to some negative implications that might come along and the ethical concerns of ours. For instance, we do see that now it works pretty well for the prediction models, but we know that China does use Google and the Chinese migration is really on the rise and we have no other way to predict Chinese migration to Europe in general. So um, there is, there is a tendency to, I wouldn't call it an overestimate, but I would say it like overlook at the weak points of what we are doing. And I wouldn't yeah, like, um, let's not call it a falsehood, but I think we have to be aware of our limits and the, and the uh, our research, research limit. Because what, currently what we are trying to do is, by the way, we are trying to replicate this study um, with, a, I, with a more specific search, and we include, because here they, they have very limited number of languages. So we got, we selected 10 languages, including Dari, you know, like uh, Pashto. So, I mean, not only Arabic, so different di dialects. And also we got Vietnamese and a couple of dialects from India. So what we try to do is let's see, you know, like if we can find it. And what we find, our preliminary findings say that there is a huge self-selection. So these people, might be, of course, all the refugees or the, so the potential migrants are vulnerable, but most of them have access to internet. They do know several languages, most of the cases, because they also use some English terms. They know where to search, what to search, what to do. And then it we uh, end up with massive effect where the mid-class can get more benefits when compared to the real group. So, okay, uh, but um, do I disagree with using that? Of course not. I mean, pro I mean, if you read a little bit about migration applications, you would know uh, Zagani. Emilio is the director of Max Planck Demographic Institute, so he's everywhere. And he mostly used social, social media data. So what they did it is they said, okay, let's use Twitter data. And if we can use it to infer international and internal migration. And they did it, you know, seven years ago. So it's not new. And seven years ago, I mean, this is his words, they could get more data from Twitter because the GDPR was more flexible. So Twitter service, service agreements were easier. But what they did is they got for three years, 2011 to 2013, they get the geolocated data of 500,000 users. So here, um, and they, in the paper, you will see that they say that they are, these are the uh, data that people gave consent. So you make your data open if you agree to share your geolocation too. So they wanted to uh, estimate the geographic move movements within and between countries. And uh, of course, they had to have people who tweet regularly. And uh, the, the most important part of the paper is not how to use Twitter data for the analysis is how to remove the selection bias. 
So um, they were aware, I mean, it's a very good paper, by the way, they were telling that they are aware of their target group. So uh, when they're talking about international migration, they're talking about mostly uh, mid-level and higher um, migrants. And of course, some countries were not there because you know, social media use uh, um, dispersion is very different among the globe. So they used a difference and difference approach. So they could reduce the selection bias, but they couldn't get rid of it. Okay, so um, they they got out migration rates for single countries, but the challenge that they had is that, especially for the largest sending countries, the statistics did not exist. So they, you know, like they do not keep records of people who are leaving. So though, you know, like when you look at the graph, you see, you know, the, the, the black one is the average and they got Mexico, USA, Germany, and Japan uh, as the examples. So you can already see the geographical movements from May to this, you know, like the last quarter of 2012 really differs, but on the average OECD is on rise. But what we see here is that all the big countries are going down. So one of the explanations of this is that, yeah, we tend to, see the bigger picture and we are trying to generalize the findings. Nevertheless, the uh, if you have enough number of small nuances, they do make a difference in your model too. So what they say at the end is that these methods can be used and they are very ambitious saying that the turning points in migration trends. So they said that you can really detect some time points. Uh, and it can, you know, Twitter data can really be used to improve our understanding. And they say that analysis relies uniquely on publicly available data. And I gotta say that we have been downloading, you know, like uh, scraping tweets uh, from Turkey in particular since last year. And what we get download is totally different because it changes every other month. So either due to Twitter itself or the users change behavior or we are restricted because, you know, like, yes, we try to download as many users or as many tweets as possible, but at the end we are working with a sample. So in short, the publicly available data is not static, it's not constant. And normally nowhere is mentioned, but in especially with the longitudinal analysis, social media data is pretty problematic because we are not talking about the same data frames. And um, unfortunately, I do not have a solution how to solve that yet at least, but we do know that um, we can at least talk about that. And the selection bias is very strong because Twitter API and Facebook API uh, are the most common uh, social media data to be downloaded and analyzed, but we know that the countries and the cultures matter in terms of use. I mean, in the Turkish case, the uh, um, important amount of the users of Facebook are housewives and the home, team, home take carers because it changed. It started with the very young people. And now you do have TikTok and then you have different social media. Uh, and we do also have a communication area. So in short, what I'm trying to say that it changes very rapidly, which makes it very difficult to develop uh, robust indicators by using the uh, social media data. And again, of course, this publicly available is a very um, controversial phrase uh, because the ethic part is uh, a little bit problematic. So um, let's have a look to another example uh, because we talked about Twitter and here, um, the uh, Gendrano et al, they wrote a very nice and very long report for the commission. I mean, if you have any interest, I'd suggest because they explained the technicality also very well, but I will also criticize them in a, in a way because the title is, you know, like, let's see what you will think. The title is Measuring Labor Mobility and Migration. So it's obvious that they're talking about the workers, right? So because labor mobility, labor migration refers to people who migrate for enumerated reasons or to work. So, but when you look at the paper, they say that the aim of this study was to investigate the potential of georeferent social media data to facilitate now casting stocks of EU movers and mobility flows. Except the title and a couple of sections you do not see anything about labor. You do not see anything about employment and you do not see anything about workers. 
So is this something on purpose? I mean, absolutely not. But these guys are not social scientists. They are not experts in migration. So what they do is they develop a very useful method. We will have a look because they use Bayesian estimates. And it really works at the end because they also do a lot of robustness checks and comparisons with the official statistics. And they find that it works, but it is it does not measure labor mobility. But they do not have any social scientists among. <laughs> so there, um, I think that was that was one of the reasons how they ended up having this very interesting report with their own title. So what they do is you know, like they're using this Bay Bayesian hierarchical model. So they start with true stocks. And then they use several different data sources. They use uh, labor force survey, they use census, population register from the Eurostat. And they also use two different Facebook data, like mostly active users and daily active users. And what is amazing that they are also addressing accuracy bias in each um, data that they refer to. So what they find here, what you see is that this is the uh, Eurostat total immigration. And you know, like it's a very basic scatter plot by the their own estimate. And they say that look, it is almost perfect fit. But here the Eurostat total immigration estimates are not for labor migration. They are again EU migration flows and mobility and stocks. The only thing that they did is they said that. Oh, when we are talking about labor migration, we are talking about active population. That's why we define our population between 15 and 64. That's the only link to labor and workers. So yeah, as you see, they're using Facebook marketing API and uh, their estimations are highly, very, very highly correlated with the statistics. So uh, one of the critiques um, of this uh, report is that we say that the statistics are not good enough, they are not reliable, and what is new about developing an indicator which is very well correlated with, uh, with measures that you're not happy with. However, uh, I now I know that they've been working on improving this thing, and now they're working on how to define some things so with, with, the, with the Facebook, like the mostly active users, so what they do is they're really using networks. So they would like to see how people interact from people where, and they say that, you know, like if you, if your interaction changed, so the close interaction, people are closer to each other. So the notes are, you know, like arranged accordingly, but in short, you know, like they end up repeating what has been said. So they say that collection of big data from Facebook and Twitter can really be used and the method of measurement and combining is really good that they suggested. The, they can produce estimates and uh, they can really compare the estimates with that. So apparently they say that it works, it's a pure assessment, but it is not improvement, if I should say. But um, we can also use, okay, we said that we can use the internet searches. And secondly, we discussed about the social media data. And the third data is the most controversial one in particular about ethics. CDR is the abbreviation of the call data records. Sometimes uh, they're all, it's also referred as a mobile positioning data. And the challenge with the CDR is the access. Social media data is somehow, you know, like publicly available through APIs, but for data call records, you need a company who grants you access. So um, before I will go in depth into this Pepe's um, very nice paper about the COVID-19 uh, pandemic and the, you know, like the data sets uh, applications. Um, if you look at the applications of mobile phone data to, to study migration, um, I'll give you a couple of examples. Uh, they have the uh, D4D, like data for development. So they have the Ivory Coast. They have Senegal uh, as the case studies. They have Turkey and uh, they have Rwanda. So in these countries, they had really nice data sets ready to be analyzed. And most of them were accessible to many researchers. But do you see something in common in these data sources or the countries? Yeah. 
anything. So do you think these are EU member states or big economies or the leading countries? So the ethical issues about CDR is highly linked with mostly with weak privacy and authoritarian regimes in general. I don't mean that the regime defines the accessibility of data. What I mean is that weak states usually um, make more sensitive and confidential data available because um, in all countries like Orange, maybe the Ivory Coast and Senegal, data are challenges, but they, do, they did not do it for France, for instance, or for other countries. So the possibility of getting access to data is tricky. But today we are going to talk about an EU example from Italy. Because the Italian government has been working closely with, oh, sorry, closely with the NGOs and uh, also with several companies. And, uh, and Pepe et al, what they did is they used a large scale data set of anonymously shared and anonymously is not very detailed and uh, defined, but it is like 170,000 de-identified smartphone users. So what they did is they got a time break, you know, like, okay, assume that we got uh, March, 2020, so what they did it, they got it from January to let's say June. So they had the smartphone users and they got them at the subnational scales and they used daily time series of three different aggregated mobility metrics. So first the origin destination movement. So be between Italian provinces, they got the radius of generation and also the average degree of spatial proximity network because they assume that you know like you talk to people close to you more frequently and it is a very very nice paper because it shows how cdr can be used to monitor the you know like immediate reaction to a shock like a lockdown in an epidemic trajectory of course it can provide us a lot of insights about future public health decision making so when you look at the um, let's say the graphs on the left hand side we do see the uh, network so you know like how they gather the information from the province and then they get r as 50 50 meters so they get different disks and those uh, they get the distance between those disks in the same time window so it uh, results in two users in the same network, let's say, so once every hour or something. So, but when you look at the scatter plot, I think it shows it very nicely because they color the disks or the dots. What you see is that the colors represent the regions like north, south, and center. And in fact, they also had an, um, uh, I, I saw in one of their presentations, not in the paper, but they, they put it on the map of Italy and you could easily see the networks, you know, like in the north, in the center and in the south. So when we look at it, it says, great, you know, like we can really see how people really, um, let's say how mobile they are, if they go somewhere, we can really talk about the spatial dispersion and temporality. And then let's say, I mean, uh, to be to be more specific, um, the, you know, like the analysis told them who is more probable to be more mobile or in a close range with other people. So what they found, it's of crucial importance to test like this in, in silico scenarios, to inform decision makers. Again, we came to the policy making and decision, make, decision making. And then user samples cannot be considered to be demographically representative. I think this is a very important weak point because we do know that in the pandemic, if we are really interested in the decision makers and police policy makers reaching out to people in need, it does not help us. By the way, I do not want to give you the impression that I'm against all those. I've been get, you know, like earning my life on this. However, it's important to know where we are not really succeeding. So age, gender is not there. And even if they are there, because we are today, I mean, working on um, CDR data from Tur Turkcell, from Turkish Telecom Operator, we do see that, see that biological sex and gender is not a reliable indicator because in most of the cases, 
your mobile, especially for women, uh, they tend to have the mobile on name of a male or someone else, or it could be a child. So user base changes over time and some demographic groups could be more or less represented at different points in time. So they really listed the limitations uh, very nicely. And they say that data is limited to users who have opted in for anonymously sharing their location with Kubik. Kubik is the company which allows, in fact, what they do is they are providing, uh, how to say, the infrastructure for the mobile phone operators. So they are really open. They have a lot of public for, public for good, um, data for public good initiatives. So they let people use their data, but they can only get the data for, from the people who opted in, who, who chose to anonymous, anonymously share their location. And what we do know of that, which is not mentioned here, most of the mobile, comes, uh, mobile phones come with by default, opting in. So if you do not know how to turn it off, your data is anonymously or not shared without your consent. Yet, um, I would say that we really use it a lot, but um, there have been also some uh, discussions around the relation between the uh, data owners and the governments because we could see that, I mean, most of the questions were around, all the discussions were around, why can't we researchers get data about the government scan the next day? So apparently the data is there, it can be anonymized, so it can be used for better. Anyhow, after CDR, we will discuss about remote sensing. We can give a break anytime when you're tired of my talking, okay? Just give me a sign. It's up to you, Hojan. When you like to give a break, just uh, okay. give a break. So I have a couple of more slides and I think maybe we can uh, give a break for five minutes or so. Okay, like so, yeah. Because then we will have really, I really would like to discuss a lot of ethics. So the, for the remote sensing, what you see here is from the IDMC. IDMC is the Internal Displacement People Monitoring Center, which helps a lot of people, especially in Africa. So this is a snapshot from their webpage. You can go see and see there what they do is they develop some indicators uh based on their analysis on remote sensing so what you see here is that they calculate the probability of an hazard and the number of people who are more who are likely to migrate when you look at it, it's really nice because they can check it for the uh, hydrometeorological tectonic or volcanic or you know like even the landslides but what they also have is that for flood they are working on drought, but they don't have it yet. But normally you can really see, like say, for instance, for Somalia, average annual displacement of the people. And then you see that, you know, like if this displacement, ex uh, this exceedance curve means that, you know, like normally, you know, like um, the tendency of people moving out, the, you know, like declines depending on the, um, let's say the environmental factor. But I will draw your attention to something else. ESA is a European Space Agency, and they did have a feasibility study, I think five years ago, which was called Big Data for Migration. And then it was very successful. And then they had the second one, which is called Migration Radar 2.0. And uh, they say that this is a very important application box or tool set to boost mitigation preparedness and response to migration feasibility study. And again, I've been in touch with them, so I can say that they did not have any social scientists on board. So they worked with a lot of geographers and also GIS people, as well as the, uh, you know, like uh, there's some uh, computer scientists to analyze the satellite data. And you'll see why, why I'm saying that. So what you see here is that this is our package. They say that, look, with satellite data, which is free, to access, but very difficult to process. We can analyze and, you know, like let's say we can gain knowledge on different things. First, we can estimate and predict departure points and causes. And then they don't say how they develop them. So, but they say that we do know where the movement starts and they can track detention and the detention centers. They can track smuggling hubs activity because they do trace 
the uh, leftovers from the camps and they do know some specific places, but they know the routes for smuggling. So they do know the coastal monitoring and illegal vessels. And this was a huge issue, especially after Italy-Libya deal. They can monitor borders, they can monitor conflicts, and they can also uh, analyze, or let's say derive some mobile statistics. So when you look at it, it looks like a dream because if we do know this, uh, let's say smuggling hopes, you know, we can really stop it. Or you say that we can really help people when they're migrating to help them to have safe journeys to wherever they're leading to. Or if we can monitor the conflicts, we can bring peace to there. However, uh, this is from the official document. Migration radar is intended to cater to diverse clients and based on their critical requirements, it is envisioned that there will be customized solutions for each client. So this is developed as a product by the European Space Agency. And on the left-hand side, you do see that client one. So they're very generous uh, about calling people clients, client one, client two. They say they have space application, they have business service interface, man mission interface. And then you say user specific data sets and solutions. They have borders, surveillance. So one thing they do not discuss is what are the ethical framework or what are the ethical guidelines for that? So if I am a minister and I go to ESA and I say that, okay, I, you know, like I would like to see what's going on on my border and you can buy it. So there is no control mechanism. So here, who is responsible for that? Because European Space Agency is an independent institute and uh, there are a lot of, they, they can even count the tents. Okay, you know, like in a refugee camp. So we are talking about, yes, it's enormous work and they worked really with very good uh, companies and computer scientists to develop these indicators and this product, but it is not, it is really developed to be sold. So um, another example is from um, UNHCR, uh, Respond Project. Um, you know, like it was an initiative and it was in 2004. What they do is uh, they are customizing maps for the UNHCR so then so that they can know how to plan and place the shelters, but also very important services like water, sanitation, power, and they can reverse evacuation, uh, evacuation plans. And UNHCR used this with IOM in 2014 and 15 uh, to, do, to um, carry humanitarian aid to Syrian people who are escaping from Syria, to Jordan and Lebanon. And what happened? They could find people in person. So everyone could get, and then there was a huge uh, discussion around the ethics of using that tracing but then they did not talk about it, but they are still uh, applying that. But we do also use it for very good reasons. Like in the of Salzburg, they're using a lot with remote sensing and they are working with doctors without borders. And uh, this is an example from South Sudan. So what they do is um, they, are, they help them, they help the doctors to plan their missions uh, for operations, but they also do population estimations in case of, you know, like humanitarian aid or vaccination campaigns. And they work very closely with the humanitarian aid workers. So to develop maps, but the East, so, you know, like what they do, for instance, they inv investigate the accessibility of floods, the population figures, effect of a war of a conflict, or they can detect changes in land cover because land cover is a very important indicator for moving you know like if you're living on crops or if you're living in an area that you need water but you are not without water so these are very strong indicators so this is one of the very very good examples and uh, what i don't have here but i would like to discuss is that there is one ngo which is called sea watch these are only computer scientists and they're trying to develop um, fair and ethical satellite data analysis to detect boats in need in Mediterranean. But what happened, uh, and they're for open science and the, their developed algorithms were used by Libyan coast to shoot 
the boats. And uh, then they started to discuss the topic of the open science because they said, yes, we do it and we want this to be accessible for everyone so that they can use it for humanitarian and good reasons, but you cannot restrict whom you are going, whom, uh, you're going to allow to use your application or data. So as you do see, I'm not talking about a lot around the technicalities or how to run the models, but it is way complicated when you really have the model or the algorithm working perfectly. So I would like to give maybe a five minutes break here so we can then start talking about the ethics part. Will it be good? Okay, Ucha. Sounds good. So right now it's let's say six different data sources. So um yeah, I, I mean I think you discuss a little bit about the ethics of computational social science in general, you know, like what it is, you know, like what are the ethical implications. But uh, the challenges of big data is doubled and it's really exponential when you add extra layers because when we're talking about vulnerable groups like migration and migrants, the risks uh, are more than anticipated. I mean, Bedushi, uh, Anna Bedushi, she's uh, with legal background and Petra Molnar, you know, like if you're interested, you can read those. So I think she summarizes it very, very nice because especially for the migration, uh, studying migrants and migration with big data, she says that the main risks are threefold. We are talking about biases because they learn from our biases. And then data pro protection and privacy rights is especially challenging for the training data sets because they might have personal information or sensitive characteristics or uh, might not have consent. And the uh, third one is the explainability and auditability. So in the deep learning models or I mean general machine learning models, you know, like the decisions are made its own. So normally um, it is important for the decision makers as well to understand what the black box is. Here, uh, I have to clarify that we are not talking about knowing to how to build a washing machine to wash your clothes, but you got to know what's going to happen when you put your clothes in, get them out. So it is, in general, uh, the auditing of decisions, especially made by AI, is still not uh, fully explored. So we need to facilitate explainability and the auditing of AI algorithms. So I don't want to go in depth here about the explainable AI. So this is not what I mean here. I'm more talking about the understanding and explaining the outputs and the decisions made by the um, algorithms. So um, if you look at the GDPR, we, what we see is that, you know, like I'm not, not going to read it all. There are some important points like information relating to an identified or identifiable natural person. Remember the examples that we gave, they all said that it's anonymous, it's the identified, but is it really? Like if I tell you some information about your friend except the name, I do think that you can guess who that person is easily if you know three data points. And I don't know if you're following what's going on, but there was a very recent article saying that today it is possible to collect 10,000 data points per person. I wouldn't be able to list 10,000 things about myself if I try to write down, but it is possible. So normally with three data points, it's very easy to identify people. So. Um, we are still walking around the bushes when we are talking about privacy and ethics, but it is very, very tricky. But this shouldn't, of course, this shouldn't stop us from using that, but we should find a way how to do it ethically responsible. So the, uh, the controller, we don't know who should determine the purpose and means of processing of the personal data. And we also have a processor. So we're talking about personal data, the owner of a person. We have a controller, we have a processor. But when you look at it uh, from an AI perspective, the processor is us because we are processing the data. Personal data comes from migrants or individuals, but we don't have a controller. So that's the entire ethical issue about the use of uh, big data. So we do know that um, it helps to uh, increase institutional awareness and power, of course, uh, for the development of big data ethics to protect individual rights. So we have to clearly draw the line using big data 
to protect individual rights is different than using big data to, when protecting individual rights. So the ethical use of data involves, of course, how to use data, how to protect privacy, but also maintain the confidentiality of data. Very good, very right statements. But then it is also important to remember that big data has strong effects on assumptions about individual responsibility and power distributions. Because where, yeah, migration is about migrants, governments, so host societies. So uh, when you're talking about the application, whatever the, like, if someone asks you to write an algorithm and to develop a product, would you really question and say that, no, I'm not gonna do that. You, you can have a lot of examples, especially recently resigned scientists from Google, but also from others too. So it is very uh, challenging for us to define our roles too, because are we also the controller? Because we are processes, but are we also the controllers? Should we, then what is the difference between a scientist in academia, like a scholar and the, and the let's say the, any less a computer professional who, who is a data scientist. So um, then the questions, what about migrants and refugees as one of the most vulnerable groups? So it is already tricky to ask their names when you're talking to them. I'm not talking about gathering things. So um, an example is that um, uh, if you follow in Rohingya what's going on, um, now UNHCR, decided to distribute humanitarian aid, so especially food and some medicaments uh, through iris scanning. So they say that by this way, they make it sure, they make it sure that the aid goes to the right person so they can track that person with very good intentions. And they say that this is completely free. And can you imagine yourselves in a position in a refugee camp where you do not agree with the authorities to scan your iris in the cost of not getting food or any kind of support. So here, the framework that we are talking about is pretty uh, difficult. And uh, when we are talking about data challenges, we do not question how the data is collected. However, it is important to think that these people might be, you know, like uh, victims of multiple issues. But we, we, what we have, we have principles. We have ethical AI principles. And I'm a big fan of person of interest. I don't know if you watch the series. It's a very, very good one. And um, once we become predictable, we become vulnerable. I think it's a very good statement. So on one hand, predictability brings vulnerability. On the other hand, we would like to know more because human beings want to understand what's coming next. So we say that our AI methods that we are referring to are or should be free from bias, free from risk, so they should be safe. I think this is the responsibility part. It should be trustable and explainable, and it should be trackable, okay? but we do have ethnic, racial, religious, and gender bias. I mean, um, for when you think about the racial bias, it's not directly linked to migration, but especially in the States, it is used a lot for the crime prediction, which means with AI, you can calculate the probability of an offender to have a second, you know, like criminal activity. And what they find is that, because it's pure background data plus facial recognition analysis, and the AI is extremely biased against uh, black people and people of color. Uh, and you know, like it gives like warnings because um, they are using for warning systems or the warning systems it, and they try to correct it several times, but then they find that the data that they use is biased because black people tend to get more sentences than the white people. So the system is biased. So can you have an unbiased, algorithm when you train your data on a biased data set. But of course, we got to find a way. And I'll give you a very interesting example, or at least I find it interesting, that, um, you know, um, 
we are conducting interviews with refugee women because I'm a mixed methods researcher. We also do qualitative interviews and um, in, in Benelux. So it was in native language, everything is in Arabic. And the topic is the migratory routes. We want to understand their journey, where they started, where did they come, what they experienced, okay? And then we had too many interviews and I said, oh, this is too difficult because, uh, you know, like in my team, it was a lot of time consuming. I said, why don't you look for an ASR, you know, like software, like automated transcription service because they are available for all languages everywhere. Yeah, at least we can double check. It's gonna save us time. So we bought one, and this everything is really happened happened accidentally, <laughs> coincidentally. So okay, we got it. We have so one interview we transcribed, okay, and then we asked the software to transcribe it. We were shocked. It was out of blue. I mean, under a lot of inserted words you know, like a lot of inserted sentences. Also, we had a lot of problems with language, with, with interpretations and connotations. We said, okay, maybe it is not correct. We got two more interviews the same. We said, maybe it's the software. We got five softwares and we analyzed six in-depth interviews. We had the same. Automated speech recognition is has a religious bias. Uh, let's say the language bias. So because it was in Arabic, it is very orientalist and it is very racist because for instance the woman says oh i would love to have my children to have good education in europe and the automated transcription services transcribes it it's not translation huh? transcription it transcribes it say that i would love to have my children to be educated under sharia and under the control of jamia and you know, it says Allah, prison, look, bombings out of blue. And then, yeah, the paper will be out hopefully in, yeah, in a couple of months. So we, we yeah, revise and resubmit last week, but it's a very interesting paper because you do see that even with a very basic automated speech recognition, even the words were not pronounced, you can have a lot of different biases. That, so. And why it is important for me? Because automated transcriptions are used for visa and asylum applications. So we assume that artificial intelligence is neutral and even free from human bias. So we say that it is um, free from risk, but whose risk? So is it the, if an algorithm is working accurately, is it really risk-free is another question. And then the trustable and explainability, who should trust it? If as a researcher, I trust, is it sufficient or is it the migrants should trust or the policymakers trackable? Is the auditability problem, let's say like by who and by who? So um, as I said, this example is always there, but you know, like who is responsible for AI is a big question. Is it the AI itself? Is it the developer? Is it the owner? But here, the data owner, what is missing in this picture is the real owner of the data, the individuals. So uh, now, if it's OK with you, I would like to, let's say, trigger you a little bit to talk, because I have some questions for you to answer that I don't have the answers yet. Because um, I'm leading a project which is called Hummingbird. And it is a mixed methods. We're combining big data with qualitative data in short. Okay, we would like to understand migration patterns better. It's a very big consortium with a lot of, um, let's say universities, industry and NGOs. Like I gotta say that, let's say European network of migrant women, CHILD, Caritas, MPG, these are very large NGOs who are working on a daily basis with migrants. So 10 countries, it's great, it's interdisciplinary, but we have a lot of problems because what we try to do is we are trying to combine traditional data with big data analytics. So we use mobile phone data, social media data and satellite images. We have very basic econometric models like micro models, macro models, and multi level models. We are using census data. And we are also using alternative methods. For instance, the mortality data I am using is, um, you can say that it doesn't have a lot to do with AI, but we are trying to optimize um, the linkage system because what I try to find is I am trying to estimate the number of undocumented migrants in Belgium. Okay, I have this, I have the population register and I have the mortality records. What I try to see is that, or let's say prove that if someone is dead in Belgium, he, she is here. 
it's a hundred percent reliable data about the presence. And if I cannot find that person in the population register, that person is undocumented. So we are trying to develop an extrapolation method to let's say adopt the excess death rates for different groups of people. So we would like to estimate the undocumented migrants. So sometimes with these new methods, you may not need new data. You can already use the data that you have in hand. So we have the media coverage. So we are to, um, we are analyzing the framing, media framing. And we also use air traffic data. I'll discuss in details. I will not talk a lot on the qualitative approach, but we are really collecting a lot of information from a lot of people, including policymakers and data providers like statistical offices to understand what do they do with big data. And in, an interesting anecdote, Swedish, um, uh, you know, that it was a senior expert that I was having the interview. He said, we don't use big data. And I said, why not? He said, our data is so good. We don't need big data. And what they, what they do is they use a lot of machine learning methods to optimize and to update data very frequently. So in some cases, the data is too good. So what we do is we are trying to estimate migrant stocks. I show a couple of examples. So with Twitter and with Facebook, you can do it for the now casting and we are trying to do it for the entire Europe, not for specific countries. What we do is, you know, like we do know that the social networks are important because we have a huge network theory about attracting more migrants. So we are trying to build similar models, the gravity model, which is a very well known migration model. So to see, of course, we are um, you know, like including several possible drivers, but we would like to see if we can estimate the migrants based on Twitter and Facebook data, but we also would like to see the impact of Brexit on highly skilled migration flows. What we do is we, for that one, I'll discuss a bit later. So my question here is, we discuss a little bit. What we do is we are working with aggregate level data, okay? And what we do is we definitely uh, anonymize the users, so we do not have the name. So we are not analyzing the hashtags, we are analyzing the users and the behavior and their geolocated data to see where they go. Do you see any ethical challenges here? What if I use Twitter to say that, okay, in the state of Louvre, we have that many, I don't know, Eritreans. Do you see, I mean, do, do we do it right? Or do you see any, well, how would you do it? You know, if I were gonna ask you to estimate the migrant stocks, I, I tell you, okay, here is the Twitter data from API, because I think most of you, you know, like got the course how to get the API data and you know what is in there. You know, you have the user IDs, you have the location. So how are you, do you see any kind of ethical issues? No is an answer too. Huh? Any examples or anything that you can think of? Would you like to say? Hojam, can you repeat the question? Maybe. Yes, my question is, assume that I gave you an assignment, okay? I told you here is the data that I got from Twitter, from API, and it is for any country, doesn't matter. And I ask you to calculate the migrant stocks, okay? so. You don't know where these people are born. You don't know the nationality of these people. What you have is the geolocation of these people and you have the language of their tweets. And through the geolocation, you can see the mobility of these people, you know, like if they changed place. So it is not the rocket science, honestly, to come up with some estimations. But my question is, would you have any concerns or ideas about potential ethical issues here because I want you to give me specific groups like say Eritreans, Bangladeshis or you know like Syrians or whatever. I can jump in. <laughs> I, I guess the most typical example would be when the Syrian refugee crisis happened and the Hungarians were trying to prevent them from like entering the country basically they were um, there was a human wall against. So if we had known where these people are, um, governments can use that data according to their policies, which may actually be not necessarily in line with human rights. Definitely, definitely. So um, you are talking about 
group privacy, which is less pronounced uh, in the ethics because we're talking about per, you know like personal data, but there is also group privacy. And if I might, if I may ask a follow up question because you jumped in, so can you think of any remedy? So will you say, oh sorry, this can be used for bad intention, so I'm not going to do it, or would you come up with some? remedies or let's say mitigation strategies how are you going to do that then um i'm not very well informed about these types of methods but i'm just gonna draw some kind of a parallel to like ethnography because that's the type of research i'm used to doing um mm -hmm. the, you normally try to hide people's um private information and change them to like if someone's name is Aisha, we change it to Fatma basically. And then if they're from a particular part of, let's say Istanbul, we just describe that area. We don't we say if someone is living, I don't know, in Sultan mm -hmm. we would be just describing that place without using those mm -hmm. um, identifiers. I guess in the case of my type of, um, I think my connection is bad. Yeah, yeah, I, I miss Porvia, but I, but I, I do see, I do see it definitely. But um, here there are two things that we can't change because the research question is about the location. You know, I'm interested in the concentration of people in a specific region and their background. Though you know, like we are not questioning the um, the validity of the indicator because it's not nationality. So we need to find a way to assign this migrantness. To these people, but um, uh, maybe I can elaborate on what I mean by you know like protecting the privacy. So when we're talking about the individual privacy, it's in layman's terms, the idea is you shouldn't be able to track that person back. Assume that I have a I have hundred people, and uh, A B C D. You know like you can change the names, I should my whatever, and I would I shouldn't be able to pick who Fatma was, okay, in my data. That's called aggregation. However, this is individual privacy, but when we are talking about specific groups, then it's a group privacy because if you do not have, a, I mean, in numbers. So what we do is the one of the ways to avoid that is uh, putting some noises on geographical locations. As you said, you know, like maybe not in Beylik, you wouldn't get, uh, let's say, a senured, but you would expand your geographical area. It is going to increase the number of people, but also it will make it more difficult to detect exactly where they are. And secondly, what we do also is um, we are trying to, it's a very easy way, publish long after enough that these people cannot be tracked. So it is also very common to analyze the data. You know, like you can get the data today, but you would see that most of the studies with social media data, except COVID, you know, people wait, let's say they wait, of course the publication is also a very time consuming period, but they wait a year or so, so that these people will not be affected. But still it is very challenging and we need to at least address the group privacy issues. This is less, let's say dangerous or controversial. What we do in our uh, project is that it is almost done now. In this case, we are not analyzing the users. We are analyzing the tweets, the content of the tweets. In fact, it's very basic. So not still not three, you know, like it's the geographical areas in Europe. So what we do is we are analyzing all the tweets from Istanbul. Okay, we got the tweets for, I think, for two years or something. We analyzed all the tweets from Istanbul and we categorize them into two groups, pro-migration, pro-migrants, so good things about migrants and migration and hate speech. And then we developed uh, some indices to give some scales for, the, for those areas. By this way, what we aim to do is we are going to see if an area is migrant friendly or not. Of course, we include the refugees in this case. So uh, we were pretty happy with this one. And of course, we had in this case some unexpected ethical issues. You might, so I think there is one question from Umut. Hujam, I have a question, yes. So in what language do you take, I mean, you just uh, give an example on 
collecting the tweets from Istanbul and looking whether they are hate speech or pro-immigrant, right? Yes. In, in what language do you do, you do this? I mean, we, we do it in 28 countries and in, in 24 languages. Hmm. Because um, what I had in mind is like when you look at Fatih, for example, mm -hmm. there are basically two groups. One, uh, the people who are uh, mostly Syrian refugees. Mm -hmm. And if you look at the like Arabic tweets, for example, in Fatih mm -hmm. region, you can find uh, pro immigrant tweets. But on the other end, if you look at the Turkish tweets, then it would probably be reversed. Yes, very, very, very interesting point. We what we had thought was that you know like we do not we selected a couple of languages for every country to check. Let's say I mean for uh, Switzerland we got both French, German, and and Italian. However, I think it's a very very nice point to check the only, you know like just I'm speculating because um for uh, we are working on a paper which is progressing now might be very interesting for you because you remember that um, in la last year, 28th of February, I guess, you know, like the president Erdogan said that I'm opening the border, you don't care me, you know, like you don't do what I want, whatever. And then the next day, and they said that, you know, hundreds of thousands of people left, so, there were a lot of speculation. So we have been collecting tweets in Istanbul and in the surroundings as a satellite project um, since that day. Uh, to you know, like to and, and we are combining the tweet data with uh, with uh, mobile phone data, and our preliminary findings show that the numbers are not as high as stated. So there is no way that that many people left because we don't see anyone around the border living yes some people left but the numbers are too exaggerated secondly the language we were checking the language and everything before the nationality on the contrary to the uh, presumptions and claims only 30 percent of them were syrians 20 percent of them were turkish other 30 percent of them were afghans and the rest was called you know like mixed so why I'm saying is that we've been analyzing the tweets in Arabic, and I'm pretty surprised to see how apolitical the, the Arabic speakers around Istanbul are, because they are mostly talking about food, flowers, Ramadan, you know, like really the, the content, because we did a lot of sentiment analysis, it's very rare that they talk about maybe they are scared, I don't know, or they're trying to be uh, careful. They talk about Assad and also some Syrian issues, but it's very rare, very rare. We couldn't see at least for one year uh, content about the uh, migration or refugees, you know, like there are some pro Erdogan statements, yes, in Arabic, but in general, they don't. So that's why we had never thought of it, but I think it's a very good point. We will definitely check it. It will be good to control at least, or maybe we can get it as a, uh, yeah, as a, yeah, we should definitely control the, uh, Migrant stocks in the country for the languages. Thanks a lot. Very good tip. Mm. Thank you. Yeah. Mm. Okay, let me just take my note. Okay, so what happened is that um, here um, the local governments are very interested in this application. They said, "Oh, it's really great," but then uh, someone in Belgium from the right, very right party approached us because he heard about this, what we are doing, and he asked, can we do it on a lower level? You know, like we said, what do you mean? Because not three is a city level. He said, yeah, is it possible to have it on, let's say, postcode level or so? And because they are uh, now working on an uh, election campaign, and they would like to target, sorry, you know, like my son is trying to hide. Sorry, yeah. No problem. Say hi from us. Sorry, sorry for the interruption. No problem at all. Now Friday evening, huh? Uh -huh. So um at the end, you know, like we had to make a decision and we had, we we tell them no because they would like to have a targeted campaign. 
So we are not Cambridge Analytica, obviously, but you know, like we have so much responsibility so that we can help them because they see hate speech as potential waters. So uh, in fact, it is not only when you write a paper, how people are going to interpret your paper and use it is also another issue is something that we are struggling with. So seasonal migration is easier because what we do is to estimate seasonal migration. It's an assessment. We are using air traffic data. This is a very large data set, you know, that combines um, eight years, almost 250 countries. So, and it's the ad, so it's a country pair. So it's more than 5,000 country pairs. So here, what we are trying to see if the time series analysis will help us to see seasonal flows, especially for some countries. I mean, in Turkey, seasonal migration refers to more internal migration, but in general, in Europe, Eastern Europe goes to, you know, like UK or Western, uh, Europe or sometimes even Southern for agriculture, for seasonal work. So, and it's very difficult to capture with official statistics. So we are trying to analyze that. So I said it, what are the ethical issues here? Honestly, there are not many ethical issues, but we do have biases here because we are talking about people who are using the um, air, you know, like air um, flights. And also it's interesting I think it's crucial to say that this data is now in the hands of GRC to commission, but it also has personal data that we don't get, but they do have a lot of information. But what is interesting is we are combining, C we are using CDR data for Turkey to analyze the impact of COVID on seasonal workers. Specifically, we heard several groups of Syrians who went to, let's say for instance, Adana, and they were stuck there during the COVID. So, what can we say about it? So we don't know how many, but CDR can help us because CDR data includes the nationality of the users, okay? So, but we do not have number of people. What we do is we add, we anonymize the users. We, we get rid of a lot of information. We only, uh, and secondly, we, we try to anonymize the cells because you collect the data from cells, we add noises. So you, you don't know exactly where and we aggregate the numbers. What I mean is we are looking at, for instance, in Fatih, how many were there Syrians who appeared in Adana one week later? Okay, so we say that, okay, it was thousand people, so whatever, and we know the location. So we will see the temporality in that. And the main ethical issue here is that um, we can reach out to a lot of information of these people. And how we came, how we get over that is something really nice, I guess. And you can also think about it further applications because it needs a lot of improvement by federated learning. So in layman's terms, we do not have access to data. So the data sits in the company service, but we do know the structure of the data and we develop the queries. So the queries are authorized by the lead researcher and then it is sent to the company. They have a look, they run the queries and then they send us the output. So they are responsible for, but we are also like the data is not ready. We are also suggesting how to anonymize data. So we are working on this and federated learning really helped us with CDR data. Of course, you need a very strong collaborator in this sense, but um, with the Turk cell, we are working pretty well. But what happens, you know, like we also have some restrictions, like we wanted to have um, with the, you know, like with the GPS coordinates, Having one more digit means sometimes, through, you know, like 10 kilometers. So uh, especially, you know, like in, in metropole, metropolitan cities, it's very tricky. You know, in the Eastern Turkey, it's okay, but you know, like we have some issues. So we are trying to find a midway, but federated learning is a very, very good option. And now we are working on how to improve it, how we can make it open access for everyone. So we are trying to develop a framework there. So for the brain drain and highly skills, we briefly discussed, and I don't wanna take a lot of your time. I know it's almost seven there. So the LinkedIn and our databases, and we use scientific uh, publication bibliometrics, and we do see that, you know, like what we check is uh, from the LinkedIn, we have just started, but we analyzed the, um, uh, the collaboration and the author, like the bibliometric, the bibliometric analysis we used 
um, the scientific publication and author affiliations, we see how much they collaborate, where they go, and we assume that their first publication place is where they are based. So we do know that PhD students are very likely to be mobile and they are usually not in their home countries, but we are measuring the mobility rather than which nationality goes where. So we are really trying to understand that it's um, the tracks, I mean, the flows between countries. And also we try to see the impact of the collaborations between um, authors. So um, honestly, uh, the ethical issues here were not there when we started to collect data from LinkedIn, but LinkedIn has recently changed their uh, term of use. So now with ORSA and with the bibliometrics, it's not a big deal, but with LinkedIn, we are facing some ethical issues. And uh, yeah, these are, let's say, privileged groups, highly skilled people, but can you think of any ethical issue that may, that may rise here using LinkedIn data to analyze for, for, the, for the network analysis for very basics? ideas like think about your own linkedin account what's going to happen if they have access to that so i was thinking maybe i mean it's in particular for the brain drain and highly skilled immigration uh i mean partially in the turkish case i think there are people who are also leaving the country for political reasons right the academics for example there are many so it's very easy to identify them and and of course you can already predict who who you want to identify and already give them the punishment that they can't leave the country, which is right, very popular in Turkish uh, government, but yeah. Honestly, we are very to the point. It's not limited, unfortunately. It's not limited to that. They can also find people who left. So, um, I mean, yeah, they can prevent people from moving because they can calculate the propensity to leave. And they can also find people somewhere else. It's not specific to Turkey. It, it happens a lot in many countries, but it is also, um, uh, you know, like one of the ethical concerns is not political, but commercial, because the companies can really track people where they are, you know, like what they do, how much they lie and their networks. I mean, you could, you know, like this year it has changed, but since, since till last year, it was really like Facebook. Once you, have someone's LinkedIn account, you could get the entire network of that person. Now they stopped, but still you can track uh, their education. So really sensitive information that you can find mostly in Facebook and Twitter. So um, the people found that some organizations use LinkedIn for fraud because they can really get, let's say, the maiden surnames, you know, like they can really get a lot of information. In our case, you know, like we are, we are waiting for um, to have the best uh, data possible and in terms of the ethical concerns. So, uh, but I, I gotta say that ORCID and other repositories are easier but very difficult to, for the gender specification, especially if you're working with Asian, Authors, it's very difficult to detect by name if it's a male or female, or you have same names, same surnames. But in general, um, it does work. It does work pretty well. And yeah, especially for scholars or people at risk, it is it is an ethical risk. So finally, um, I'm I'm going to talk about the um, the environmental induced migration. What we do is, as I said about the satellite data, we are working on Somalian case. And we are working on like 100 by 100 grids, okay? So really, really small, but we do not track people. We do not count people. What we are trying to do is we're trying to drive some variables for land cover, for floods, for droughts. So we are getting, we have the period from 2015 to 18. And Sentinel 1L2 is the free data. I should say that when I dive into satellite data and see the availability of satellite images and the proximity, I was losing my mind. I mean, the, the myth, the conspiracy myth that they can read your newspaper is correct, okay? And this is the free data. If you pay, you can even get more precise data. But if you would be interested and have time, I suggest you to read because we have a blog. Um, uh, we wrote it for another project like So Big Data uh, about how Earth observation data can be used for human migration, also discussing the ethical concerns. Um, and 
here I just would like to give you a couple of examples and I hope you will come up with some ethical issues because with the with the satellite data we can track the routes we can count the tents we can see where pe what are the routes where people go from we can also use we can let's say survey we can observe the borders what's going on around the borders and uh, we can like there is one study which is I don't know why. I mean, I was very surprised that it was published. It is in Jordan. They are counting cars, and they buy. I mean, they are counting the cars which disappear in all the streets to calculate the number of people who migrated. So they can really count the car that you parked in front of a building or so. So can you come up with a couple of ethical issues here with the satellite data? I think that's the easiest one, huh? Yeah, that might be for the case of uh, conflict reasons, war, conflict regions, war regions. I mean, in yeah. those places, uh, either side can use that sensitive information to uh, to guide their uh, war strategies, for example, or mm -hmm. target the uh, enemy, etc. Yeah, exactly, exactly. I mean, that has been used actively in Afghanistan. And I, I should say what they do is, you know, like they're trying with satellite data, they are trying to see if there is a new uh, mobilization and they detect where to bomb. I mean, very, very, very harsh. But it is also used, I mean, there is one a use of satellite data where they combine mobile phone data and they can detect the demonstrations in advance. So they see that people are coming together and then they get a lot of mobile phone signals in a specific area. So uh, countries can, uh, let's say, plan and uh, send their police force there. So a lot of ethical ethical issues, but I, I, I would say that the main challenge, I mean, for me, the biggest issue here is who has the data because the data is free. This is the freest data among all types of big data. If you go to ESA data page or, or NSA, you know, like NASA, everywhere, the data is free. If you know how to process it, you can get raw data up to 10 meters proximity. And since 2060, sorry, so 1960, I, I lost the time. So the data is very old, very diverse and all over the world. And you can really use it for, so, but there are also very good uses, as I said, because it's really, really, really promising. So to cut it short, um, what we are doing is with the CDR data, with, with Turkcell, we are using logs, I mean, call data records and mobile positioning. So we are trying to estimate number of specific migrant groups in Istanbul. As I said, the ethical issues here are less because we are using federated learning, but still we decided to group some nationalities for their safety, let's say, okay, Syrians, we're talking about thousands, but when you're talking about, let's say, Uzbek or Kazakh migrants, so we really gathered several groups and we decided not to report less than 50 or 100 people. So what we do with the CDR is we combine it with nightlight satellite data in Istanbul case. We do know that not all uh, refugees are registered. We do know that they tend to live in non-residential areas dumped buildings or old factories as well. And now what we try to do is we are trying to detect the residential areas through night lights because you wouldn't expect night lights in a dumped area or in abandoned buildings. And then we are gonna check if there are active, like uh, let's say mobile signals around the region. We would like to see the dispersion in the city. So yes, we know in Fatih, in Esenyurt, and in some in Zeytinburu, there are many Syrians, but there are also in different areas. And we would like to see if we can develop an estimate, which is going to give us a proxy to see how much we are missing. Because for working reasons, refugees in particular in Istanbul, only one person from one family uh, registers. So we are going to work on the residential areas, and we would like to come up with some suggestions how to help those people in terms of access to services. And uh, I already discussed this uh, mortality register. So in, in both cases, as, um, we are extremely careful with the nightlights data because what if the police know where they are, where they live, and then try to get rid of them? And But I guess we do have one question I see hand raising. 
Yeah, hi. Thank you so much for the talk, Professor Burkhan. I was wondering, um, I'm not super familiar with the like migration and movements of people, so maybe this question is a bit silly, but I've done some work in like disaster research. Mm -hmm. And um, and I, I remember once reading a study that claimed that using tweet data and the number of tweets in an area, we can get act as a proxy for how much that area was hit mm -hmm. with disasters. But then another study came out and said that, well, actually, some of the areas that were most hit just don't have access to phones or Twitter accounts. Mm -hmm. So um, these areas that were really, really hit um, uh, were completely overlooked because just no phones, no Twitter accounts. So I was wondering, is there, first of all, are there any migrants who like don't have phones, don't have Twitter accounts? And if these this group does exist, like the most disadvantaged group, is there a way to track them and like see um, mm -hmm. What's going on with that? No, I mean it's it's a it's a very good question, and it is something that we do discuss a lot as well. Cause this is about the selection bias, you know, like this is about you are targeting a group, assuming that they have mobile phone, they have internet, whatever. I got to say that if we are talking about Europe in general, like migrants who are trying to come to Europe, most of them, yes, they do have mobile phones. However, let's say in Africa, it's not the case. That's why we are trying to refer to satellite data, you know, like to detect the tracks because like to see the routes where they're going. And one of a very um, easy example is um, to give you a little bit background. In 2015, Syrian influx to the Europe. In 2016, EU signed a deal with Turkey saying that keep the Syrians. And then there, this is, you know, like from Turkey to Greece is Eastern Mediterranean Europe. It stopped because Turkey didn't send them. And then they started to go through Central Mediterranean route, which is Italy. And then in 2017, Italy signed a deal with Libya saying, keep them, don't send them here. Okay. What well, next thing happened, the arrivals in as of 2018 started to be in Spain. So there is no way to get the numbers because you only know the people who arrived. But when we analyze the satellite data, it's very easy to see the change of routes. And you can even get guess the density of people. So maybe not the exact number, but we can say how things changed. So for the disaster, uh, I would say that more than Twitter, CDR, the mobile phone data is used more because people call their loved ones immediately. So the, the mobile phone activity is a better indicator in general in disasters. But when we are talking about environmental disasters in remote areas, you're right. It's very difficult. So most of the humanitarian aid organizations are using satellite data. It's not the best option, but it is the, yeah, that it's the best that we have in hand currently. Thank you. Welcome. So to wrap up, um, I know, or I assume that you are not all ethics experts, but if you are interested, or let's say, had some ideas after several days in this uh, summer school, and also from this course, we are organizing a workshop and ethics and privacy of big data use for migration research. It's going to be in October. And we are expecting, you know, like abstract. So it's 10th of July is a deadline. And it is going to be published as a book from Springer, most probably the selected um, presentations. Please do not hesitate. So we are not looking for extremely technical perspectives only because we do have, but we would like to have a lot of junior researchers on board to have some critical reflection. So if you are interested, then you can check the web page. I really would like to thank you a lot, uh, you know, like for listening to me for two hours. And I do hope that it was not so out of your scope. And uh, I already gave you a reading list, but you know, like I'll also send my presentation I sent to Emre, so probably he might make it available if you're interested. And then you can always contact me, you know, like in terms of any questions, you know, like uh, I try to respond depending on the time, but in general, do not hesitate, you know, like I'm, I'll be more than happy to answer.